If you're in business, you probably have a website, but can your site handle your growth? How many visitors before your site slows down or crashes? What about storage and data security? From web hosting to virtual servers, Pair Networks provides the online infrastructure you need to start, grow, and flourish. When it comes to security and updates, don't worry, we've got you covered. Our 24-7 U.S.-based customer support is the best in the industry. No frustrating chatbots are sitting on hold for hours. Check out Pair.com today to learn more. That's P-A-I-R dot com. Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Coffin, and I'm here for Attitude Magazine's weekly ADHD Experts webinar series. Our topic today is behavior therapy, an extremely important one, and we are very pleased today to have uh, one of the nation's experts on behavior therapy, Dr. William Pelham. It's very well documented that behavior therapy helps children with ADHD. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends it as the first line of treatment for children diagnosed before age six. And through high school, guidelines call for behavior therapy to be used in conjunction with medications. But parents frequently need to know more. Should behavior therapy be tried before medication at the same time? How do you know if it's working? So we're so pleased today to have Dr. Pelham to discuss these questions and many more. He'll be talking about topics such as the advantages of starting behavior therapy soon, early, how behavior therapy paired with medication can help severe symptoms of ADHD, and why behavior therapy alone may be sufficient for some kids to function well in school and at home. He will be offering some detailed approaches parents and teachers can use to implement behavior therapy consistently at home and at school. I know that's no small challenge. Let me tell you a little bit about his background. It's a super impressive one. He is the director of the Center for Children and Families at Florida International State University and has a long and distinguished history as a researcher in treatment development and evaluation for ADHD children. He runs a summer treatment program for ADHD children that has been very widely recognized by the Society of Clinical and Adolescent Psychology, by the American Psychological Association, and many other professional organizations as a model program, the -the state-of-the-art in treatment for children and adolescents with ADHD. I'm going to be referring you to his website later on also, but let me just mention it now because there are a, a significant number of resources there that many of you will be interested in. It's www.ccf. Dot .fiu.edu will also post that in your chat box. Thank you so much, Dr. Pellin, for joining us today. We are very grateful for your time and your expertise. Before we start, just let me mention our sponsor today's webinar. We're so grateful to our sponsors. They allow us to present week after week at no cost to our listeners. And the sponsor of today's webinar is SOAR, S-O-A-R. SOAR offers extraordinary outdoor programs throughout the United States and internationally for youth and young adults diagnosed with ADHD and other learning disabilities. For over 40 years, SOAR has given participants the opportunities to build friendships, develop life skills, and experience success through outdoor adventures. For lots more information and details about SOAR's summer camps, their boarding school, their gap year, and other programs, please visit them online, SOAR, it's S-O-A-R, ncnorthcarolina.org. So thank you to SOAR. And with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Pelham again with our thanks. So thank you, Susan. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for asking me. Although we're going to be talking about uh, behavioral interventions and treatment for ADHD, I wanted to start with a little bit of information about ADHD. I'm sure most of you are on this call because you know a lot about ADHD. So I just wanted to do this very quickly. The prevalence rate of ADHD Uh, according to the CDC now, is pretty high. It's about 11% of the population, 8% to 12%, depending on what part of the country you're in. It's the most common behavioral referral to healthcare professionals, the most common referral or diagnosis in special education classrooms in the country, the most common cause of behavior problems in regular classrooms, and the most common diagnosis in mental health facilities. So ADHD is highly prevalent, and professionals in school settings Healthcare settings and mental health settings are all involved in treatment for ADHD. So that's a prevalence rate, you see. Why is it important to treat ADHD in childhood? What we're talking about today is treating ADHD and starting in childhood. And that's because it causes substantial problems in daily life functioning, as you all know, for for the children themselves, for their families, for their teachers and schools and classmates, and for their peers around the neighborhood and uh, in a variety of settings. And... Unfortunately, 
uh, in the absence of effective treatment, the outcomes for children with ADHD in adolescence and adulthood are not good. I just finished a research meeting with our team here, uh, looking at some of the data from our long-running PAL study, which has looked at uh, ADHD children since 1986 and how they're functioning now. And we're looking at financial outcomes for ADHD individuals who are now 30 years old. And they still have quite a few problems uh, compared to the children who don't have ADHD. So our goal of treating in childhood is to try to prevent the, uh, the adverse outcomes that characterize ADHD in adolescence and adulthood. And ADHD has uh, one of the reasons it's important is not just for uh, families and for the individuals themselves, but it has major costs to multiple sectors of society, including healthcare costs, juvenile justice system, families and schools. So it is a serious public health problem. In fact, in terms of cost to society, ADHD is a more expensive cost as a disease or a disorder than is stroke. And everybody knows stroke is an important public health problem and has serious complications and serious costs for society. And ADHD is even more expensive for our society than stroke. Uh, I stick this slide up here. If you're a parent, you probably read this book. Your kids have certainly read it because uh, ADHD is, uh, is prevalent. Discussions of ADHD are prevalent throughout our whole society. You can't go a week without reading about ADHD in the newspaper. And even in children's literature, ADHD is discussed. These Captain Underpants books are a very nice set of books. And they're about the two little boys in the lower right-hand corner of that picture. Um, kids love them, and their parents like to read them also. And in this book in the series, we discovered that the experts at their elementary school had different opinions about the two boys about which the books are written. A guidance counselor thought they had ADD. School psychologists thought they had ADHD, and their principal thought they were just plain BAD. Um, when you look at this slide, I'm not going to dwell on this. I'll let you look at this slide carefully on your own, and you see that there's some very clever plays on uh, the names of the guidance counselor and the school psychologist. And I put this here also to point out that, uh, that the different professionals can give different diagnostic labels to kids with ADHD and can focus on different symptoms of ADHD. The DSM has long list of symptoms of so the inattention symptoms of ADHD or the hyperactivity and pulsivity symptoms for ADHD. And most of uh, professionals and most parents are taught to focus on these symptoms, to think about the symptoms in making diagnoses and to think about improving the symptoms in treatment. The approach of most people to do behavior therapy is very different from that. Our approach in our clinic is very different from focusing on symptoms. What I argue that is that symptoms are not what we should focus on in either diagnosis or treatment in homeschool and peer settings. Instead, we focus, and the field is moving more and more towards focusing on impairment or problems in daily life functioning, rather than the DSM symptoms of the disorder. The reason for that is that that's why children get referred. Nobody gets referred for treatment because a mom is, uh, is uh, sitting in bed at night reading the DSM or reading an article about the DSM symptoms of ADHD. Uh, kids get referred for treatment because the teacher calls the parents and says, we need to come in for a conference. I'm having difficulty with your child in school. Or the parent notices that things aren't going well at home in terms of uh, their child being able to do his or her daily chores or getting into trouble around the neighborhood. It's these problems in daily life functioning that are why kids get referred for ADHD, not the DSM symptoms. In addition, we have 50 years of research in the field of psychology showing that what determines what your outcome is going to be like as you grow older is not the symptoms of ADHD. So inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity don't drive or don't determine how you're going to turn out when you're an adolescent or an adult. Instead, the key domains are your peer relationships, uh, what your parents are doing in terms of parenting and your academic functioning in school, your achievement in school and your behavioral functioning in school. So peer relationships, parenting, and school functioning are the three key domains that determine across 50 years of research, across all aspects of child development and mental health, determine who's going to be doing well and who's still going to have problems down the line. That's what we should be focusing on 
and treatment, and that's what we should be focusing on in diagnosis and evaluation and in initial uh, assessments and initial evaluations of ADHD to get an idea of what we want to focus on in treatment. And our goal is not to eliminate the DSM symptoms. It's not to get a reduction on a checklist rating of DSM symptoms. It's to minimize the child's problems in daily life functioning and to maximize adaptive skills that can overcome those problems. So if a child has difficulty getting along with other children, it's teaching them social skills, teaching them how to get along better with other children in the context of sports activities, in the context of the classroom at school, and so forth. And the last line of this slide is very important. All the treatment that I talk about with behavioral treatment is skills training. We teach parents parenting skills, we teach teachers classroom management skills, and we teach the children, the ADHD children themselves, social skills. So the main focus of treatment for ADHD uh, is not on symptom reduction, it shouldn't be on symptom reduction, it should be on skills training for the parents, the teachers, and the children with ADHD. One last point about diagnosis, what this means, by the way, if you buy what I'm saying to you about, uh, about uh, the focus of intervention being problems in daily life functioning, is that don't go to a therapist or a clinic to get a diagnosis for ADHD if they say they have a long evaluation battery and you have to go in and spend a whole day and take a whole bunch of different tests, and, uh, and some of those are medical tests, some of them are computer-based tests or psychological tests, all of that with the goal of diagnosing the child. Diagnosing ADHD is really simple. If you follow the DSM approach, it's do the parents and teachers say that the child has a sufficient number of these symptoms on the DSM-based rating scales? Those are the DSM symptoms I showed you a couple of slides ago. That's easy to do. A parent or teacher rating scale can do that. So it's easy to, to evaluate whether the symptoms are present or not. There is no test, no computer-based test, no medical test, no psychological test, nothing that can evaluate whether or not a child shows those symptoms in the natural environment. Instead, you ask the parents and teachers on standardized rating scales or maybe in an interview whether the child is showing those symptoms. And then you're done with asking questions about symptoms. Everything else you focus on in an initial evaluation of ADHD should be what are the child's problems in daily life functioning and what treatments does the scientific literature tell us can make those problems in daily life functioning better. So for example, one of the instruments that we use in initial assessments, is, is we call it the impairment rating scale. And it simply asks parents and teachers to tell us how they see the child's problems in these domains. The same domains I mentioned earlier, problems with peers, siblings, problems with parents, parents and teachers, academic progress, the family in general, overall need for treatment. That's our focus. It's not how many symptoms of ADHD the child has, it's what their problems are in daily life functioning. So once you've had an initial assessment and it's a broad spectrum assessment to look at the child's problems and functioning, then the question is what treatments should parents be looking for? I always like to start talks like this with a list of treatments that don't work, things that parents should be avoiding. Any therapist that tells you that they need to see your ADHD child in a clinic once a week for an hour and they do something with the child, whether it's play therapy, uh, cognitive therapy, biofeedback, perceptual or motor training, uh, occupational therapy, none of those treatments are effective or evidence-based for ADHD. And what I mean by that is that there are no studies showing that they work. There are no scientific studies showing that any of these treatments for ADHD work, even though they're widely uh, advertised and widely used all over the country. So you should avoid any therapist that tells you they're gonna do any of these uh, treatments for ADHD. The last one, number 12, is a joke. Uh, please don't think I, I believe that one should use duct tape for ADHD, but I put that up there after uh, four or five years ago, there was an article in USA Today about a teacher in Missouri that did duct tape the child to his desk and duct taped his mouth closed. It was a child with ADHD. The teacher, of course, uh, was fired and uh, arrested for having done that. Uh, but that. That shows the degree to which the teacher had been uh, really stressed out by the ADHD child and they'd done a ridiculous intervention instead of learning good classroom management procedures to work with the child at school. So these are treatments you don't want to work do. All of the professional associations in the US and in the world have said that 
these are the interventions that do work for ADHD in the short term. Behavior modification or behavior therapy, that's what we're talking about today. Stimulant medication, we'll talk some about that today, and the combination of the two. And we'll talk a fair amount about how to combine stimulant medication and behavior modification. Uh, I've been in the field since the very beginning of ADHD, and I've done a whole bunch of the studies on behavior modification, on stimulants, and on the combination of the two. So I've had a lot of experience working with all of these three approaches, and these are the approaches that all of the professional societies say is what we should be using for ADHD. But there are questions that remain. For example, if you have three treatments that work, how should you sequence those treatments? If I know that medication works in the short run and I know the behavior therapy works in the short run, which one should I do? Well, some people say to start them both at the same time. And that's a common recommendation by many societies. Chad recommends that you do both of those treatments. You do both behavioral treatments and medication and you start them at the same time. The typical practice for physicians is to give the parent a prescription uh, for medication after the first visit. And then maybe they'll say to the parent, also, you should go find some parent training someplace in the community. But if you do that, if you start both treatments at the same time, how do you know which one is working? You can't know which one is working. The only way you can know which one is working is to pick one to start, try it, see how much it works, see whether you need more. And if you need more, add the other treatment in. And if you get an incremental benefit, then you know that the second one is helpful. However, you wouldn't have known whether the second one would have taken the place of the first one. So the only way to really know is to pick one treatment to start with and then see how far you get and add another one, but pick one that is gonna make sense to start with. And I'll show you a study at the very end of the slides today that says that it actually works much better to use behavior modification or behavior therapy as your first treatment when you start and then add medication if you need to. The opposite sequence turns out to be a very bad approach to working with ADHD kids, even though that's the typical practice for physicians. And the way to know whether or not your child needs combined or multimodal treatments I'll argue is to start with behavior therapy, see how the child does. A substantial number of ADHD kids in our most recent study, which was reported in the New York Times about a month ago, we found that uh, a third of ADHD kids were fine with just a very brief course of parent training, behavioral parent training, and a daily report card at school. So for a third of our kids, that's all they needed. That's a very easy treatment for parents to do, a very inexpensive treatment to get. Uh, the others uh, needed more treatment, the ones who got more behavior modification and the ones who got medication added to the behavior modification, both did equally well. So what are some of the limitations of pharmacological interventions? I'm gonna just mention one or two here and then let you look at this slide on your own later. The main limitation to medication as a treatment for ADHD is number nine. We have 40 years worth of studies to show that medication has absolutely zero long-term benefits. That's despite the fact that it has huge acute short-term effects. But you as parents are not looking for a medication that's gonna make your child better only for today, only while he takes the pill. You want something that's, gonna, uh, that's going to cause him a result in his having not only a better childhood, not only being better at home, being better at school, but better movement into adolescence and a better outcome when he's a young adult and throughout life. You want something that's gonna work in the long run, not just the short run. And our literature, unfortunately, shows absolutely clearly that medication has no long-term benefits and should, should never be the only treatment that's used because of that. Here's some key treatments for ADHD, key, key, key principles in treatment for ADHD. I wanna go over these quickly, then I'm gonna go over these again at the end. Uh, ADHD, as you know, I assume we have parents out there who have teens with ADHD as well as young kids. You know that ADHD is back to something that goes on for a long time it's, and it requires a chronic disease model of care. That is, you start treatment and treatment gets changed over time and may be more or less intensive, but it doesn't stop. I've already mentioned that functional impairment is the key. Teaching skills to parents is the main thing. And I will argue based on our data later, that if you're going to add medication, you want to use medication at a very low dose. And then low below that, interventions need to be feasible and palatable for families because you want family to keep, families to keep them up for a long time. 
and early intervention is important, and all interventions for ADHD need to be scientifically evidence-based. You need to go to trusted websites to find out what has scientific support and what doesn't have scientific support. So keep these key principles in mind. I think I'm going to skip this slide. You can look at it later. This is basically talking about what you do in a parenting approach to work with ADHD. If you have not, if you're parents out there and you've not gone to take a parenting class, a behavioral intervention program that teaches you uh, skills for, for using with your ADHD child, you should all go do that. And you can go to our website to see what kinds of parenting programs are available out there and what kinds of things work. But teaching parents skills is the single most important intervention that we can do for children with ADHD. There are a lot of ways to do it. There are uh, individual sessions, there are group sessions, lots of different ways, but the major thing we do is teach parents how to manage their children's behavior. And if parents learn and then go home and implement that consistently, then the kids are gonna get better. And that means learning how to uh, pay positive attention to your children when they're doing what you like, and how to provide consequences that are mild consequences that encourage them to do things you like when they're doing things that are problematic and doing that consistently over time. It's, a lot of it's good old fashioned parenting, but it's doing it consistently and then having a support group uh, to support your doing it. I don't need to tell you this. This says ADHD, children with ADHD can produce parental distress. I had a couple of slides in here showing what kind of distress I'm talking about, but I don't think we have enough time to go over that. Uh, now, we've done studies, we've done studies, for example, showing that if you have parents inter interact with ADHD children and give them the opportunity to, to drink alcohol after that, that parents who've interacted with ADHD kids uh, tend to drink more than parents who haven't. The same is true for divorce. Parents of ADHD kids are more likely to get divorced because they're stressed in dealing with their kids. That leads to uh, to problems between parents and drinking. So we want to avoid those difficulties and get parents involved and teach them good parenting skills so these kinds of outcomes don't happen. This, by the way, was a headline in a newspaper that wrote about a study we did a long time ago. Okay, for behavioral interventions in schools, it means teaching teachers some of the same things that we teach parents. Teaching teachers how to do good classroom management practices. These are a list of the different things that we can teach, but I think I'll show you the one thing that's absolutely essential for kids with ADHD, and that's a daily report card, where we teach teachers how to do daily report cards with children in school. Daily report card is simply a, a simple procedure. It's a parent or a therapist working with the child's teacher to decide what the child's goals are at school. What's gonna make that child function better in the classroom? What are the major things that need to be reduced in terms of problems or improved in terms of academic work? And then setting up a simple system for a teacher to evaluate how a child's doing periodically throughout the day, give the child feedback, and then provide a note home that tells the parent how the child did. Parents then uh, follow up at home with rewards for the child for having had a good day at school. There are more studies on daily report cards than almost any other form of intervention for ADHD. These things work. They cost almost nothing. If you go to our website, the ccf.fiu.edu, and that has a packet you can download called How to Set Up a Homeschool Note. And a parent can take it to their teacher, their child's teacher at school, and you can set up a homeschool note exactly like that daily report card I'm talking about. That's the single most important thing that we do in schools for children with ADHD. We get teachers and parents to collaborate to set that up. So I briefly talked about parent training. I briefly talked about the child intervention. I mean, the, the school intervention. Child intervention for ADHD, you remember I said at the beginning, is working with parents, working with teachers, and working with children. The child's intervention is focused on teaching social skills, teaching the child how to get along better with other children and how to develop friendships. We, for a long time, have done this using a summer treatment program approach, a summer camp approach, and a Saturday approach. And uh, the program that we developed actually has won lots of awards uh, from the American Psychological Association, SHAD, listed on the SAMHSA website. It's a, a summer camp that has a therapeutic component. And the kids during the course of the day have a little bit of classroom time where they're, where they're working on their academic work at school. It's a very behaviorally oriented classroom. 
And then when they're outside the classroom during the summer, they're in groups of 12 to 16 children of the same age, all ADHD, with four or five paraprofessionals who are working with them, and they're playing sports activities, recreational activities. And we're focusing on teaching them how to get along better with each other in the context of sports. The whole focus is on how can you be a better team member if you're trying to play soccer with other children the same age, for example. And this is a terrific program. Uh, our program actually is taught, is done in about a dozen places around the country, but components of it can be done anywhere and are done in, uh, in summer camps all over the country. Here's just a couple of pictures of what it looks like. Here are current sites that are currently summer treatment program sites, and there's no reason it can't be every place. Uh, the, the materials for doing this are on our website, on our ccf.faa.edu website. They're free. It's 1.30. So the manual that tells you how to do this whole complex program can be downloaded and anybody can learn how to do it. Schools can do it. Universities can do it. Community centers can do it. I encourage you all to, uh, if you're living in communities where this is not done, to find a mental health professional uh, who can do this or a school who can do this and they can go to our website, take all the materials and run with it. They can also call us up and we'll, we'll consult with them and take them, tell them what they need to do to get started. So I strongly encourage you to do this because working with peer relationships in ADHD children is really hard. It's hard to do. And this is a terrific program to do that. So what about combining behavioral intervention and pharmacotherapy if initial treatment is not sufficient? So what this picture shows here is the blue line tells if you're just doing medication for a child with ADHD and there's no behavior therapy involved, how much better the child is as you increase the dose of medication. So you can see that uh, this, this group of kids had 60 rule violations in the classroom when they were on placebo and there was no behavioral intervention in place. And then the black line shows you what it was like when they were on placebo with the behavioral intervention in place in the classroom. So you can see the rule violations went way down. So the behavioral treatment was very effective. And actually it was more effective than a pretty high dose of medication, which the blue line shows you. And when you combine the behavioral intervention, that's the black line, then actually you get a little bit more improvement with medication, but it all comes at the lowest dose. So one of the big advantages of combining behavioral and pharmacological treatments is you can reduce the dose of medication you need if you start with behavioral interventions, hugely so. So we did a big study that uh, this is a complicated slide and all you have to do is look at the left-hand side of the slide. Some participants in the study either started with a low dose of behavior modification, that was parent training, some group parent training sessions for two months, once a week for two months, and a daily report card, or they started with the low dose of medication. We used standard stimulant medication for ADHD. We tracked the kids for a couple of months, and then if they were fine, then they just continued to get that low dose of treatment. If they were not, then they either got more intensive treatment of what they started with, or we added the other modality in. So if the child did not do fine, uh, and he started with behavioral intervention, then either he got more intensive behavioral intervention or he got medication added to what he started with. And the opposite was true for kids in the medication-only group. What we found was very interesting. We treated kids for a whole school year, and here's the main result. It's pretty easy to look at this. Um, I want you to look at the column that's called behavior plus medication, and the one that's called medication plus behavior. Notice that the behavior plus medication column shows an average of eight rule violations per hour for the kids in that treatment condition. This is observations of how they're doing in their classroom setting. The children who got medication plus behavior, in contrast, had 16 per hour. They had almost twice as many rule violations. And the only difference between those two groups, those two groups ended up with the same treatment. They both got both medication and behavior modification. But the one that was called behavior plus medication started with behavior modification and then had medication added in if it was necessary. The one that's called medication plus behavior started with medication and had behavior modification added in if necessary. And what you see is it didn't work nearly as well to start with medication and add behavior therapy to that. It worked much better to start with behavior therapy and then add medication or more behavior therapy if you need it. 
it was a dramatic finding in the study and one that we were not ex necessarily expecting. And our big question was, why, is that, why does it make a difference? If everybody ends up on multimodal or combined treatment, why does it make a difference which one you start with? And we think we know the answer in the study, and that's that parents who started with medication and were later assigned to attend the parent training groups, for example, and to set up a daily report card with the teacher at school simply didn't do it. This slide here simply shows that if you started with behavior modification first, uh, you were much more likely to attend parent training and to attend booster treatment than if you started with medication first. So we think the reason the results of the study is what they were is that parents simply, once they had medication for their child, didn't engage in the behavioral intervention. And you have to engage in the behavioral intervention. You have to attend the parent training. You have to set up a daily report card at school to have your child have any advantages from it. So this is a very big study. And again, you can see it written up in the New York Times last month. It was on NBC News a couple of weeks ago. I encourage you to, to go look at this if you have questions about sequencing of treatments, which one to start with. Because this study showed absolutely clearly the best way to treat is to start with behavioral intervention and then add medication if necessary. So Susan, can I stop now and... Absolutely, that, that was extremely interesting and um, very provocative. Number of questions here, you can, as you can imagine, many people on the webinar started with medication because as you mentioned, um, that is what's most likely to happen when you see a, a doctor and your child's diagnosed. Just as an aside, one person asked, and I'll throw it out there, why do we think that doctors do start with medication and, and are so unaware of behavior therapy? Is it just not? It depends on what kind of doctor you're talking about. Most medication for ADHD children is prescribed by pediatricians. Pediatricians, right. Your pediatrician's training does not include much training at all on psychosocial approaches to working with children's uh, uh, children's medical problems or their behavior problems. Mm -hmm. And it's really unfortunate because one out of every three visits to a primary care physician, that is to a pediatrician, is not for a physical problem, it's for a behavior problem. Right. Or an emotional problem, and half of those are for ADHD. So they really do need a lot more training, but they don't get it. So it's not that they, uh, they are doing a treatment that they know is wrong, it's that they don't know what the alternative is. Right. And the the AAP has done a very good job of putting guidelines out, telling physicians, you should be doing parent training. You should be either doing it or having your nurses do it or refer your patients to somebody who is. Unfortunately, they're all very busy. They want to give the prescription to the parent at the first session because the parent wants something to help them and they want it, want it right away. So the doctor does that and then he doesn't think about it. He doesn't realize that, that uh, he just gave that prescription out and he doesn't see the parent again for three or four months parent is happy, and so he doesn't think about the parenting part. It's not intentional, it's just the way they're trained and then what happens in the natural process. Um, yeah, um, someone says, every child except mine with ADHD is on medication. <laughs> um, um, uh, first first off, so there are a number of uh, obviously very concerned parents on, on this webinar who are saying, you know, sh what should I do? Should I stop medication and start behavior therapy or should um, is it enough? How do I correct the mistake that I've made? If you understand what I just said, what I said was that in our big study, we found that if you started with medication, parents did not engage in behavior therapy subsequently and their children did not have as good outcomes. But if you're a parent listening to this and your child's medicated, but you're taking the time to, to listen to this website, to this webinar, it means you're interested in additional things. Okay. And you start parent training now and you go and you start implementing things at home, you're going to have a good outcome. You have to add it in. It's that many parents don't do that because they rely on right. Medicaid. So the it's, not, point, it's not that they made a terrible mistake and, they, and there's no going back. In other words, that's what some people were fearful of. They made it, you know, that, that, that how do they undo their mistake? You're saying it's, it's not that. It's just fully embracing parent training as part of the behavior. That, that's correct. The other okay. thing I would add is that uh, most kids are taking way too much medication, so the doses they're taking are too high. Mm -hmm. And high doses of medication, you, uh, in the short run, you eliminate most of the child's problems. So there may not be much for parents and teachers to work on. I believe that, that parents should try to lower the dose of medication as much as possible when they're starting behavioral treatments. And as they're getting really good with behavioral treatments, they may discover that they can use lower, lower, lower doses of medication. And the lower right. the dose the better in the long run. Okay. See, that, that's, that's yeah, absolutely, because 
over the long run. And can you just speak, I, I want to come back, people are very interested in hearing more about parent training and techniques, if you can suggest some practical um, things for people. But can you just talk a little bit about this, the studies? I know it's a multimodal study that shows that there's no long-term benefit from medication. I think that, you know, everyone knows that there's a short-term ability to focus and some people rely on that in order to help their child not fall behind in school. It, what does it mean for the long, what do you, what do you, can you tell us more about the studies that show no long-term improvement? Are you saying that there's no short-term improvement or simply that once you stop medication, any improvement goes away? Is that? No, there's, there's I wouldn't say that. No, no parent yeah. who's ever, very few parents who've seen their kids medicated would deny that medication has an effect, has a whopping effect. In fact, if, if, uh, if some evil person kidnapped me because they had an ADHD child and they were kidnapping me because I'm a famous expert and they said, I, I want you to make my kid better today or, and I'm not going to let you go until you do, mm -hmm. I would say, haven't have any medication around because I know I can make it better. <laughs> right. By the way, uh, to use the behavioral approach, I'm going to have to, you know, be a captive for eight weeks and teach that parent parent training. Okay. So it has big effects. Medication has big short-term effects, but there are no long-term effects. So, and this is a huge puzzle. This is how I got into the field, actually, early on. I got very interested in why medication didn't have any long-term effects. And the first big study I did with medication was looking at academic functioning. And we discovered that medication, actually, it was the first study that looked at medication effects on classroom behavior. And it showed that medication had big positive effects on kids' seat work performance. That is doing the kinds of seat work tasks that the teacher gives the kids in the class when they're working with a small group up in front. So mm -hmm. the, the folder that you give the kids and say, okay, here's your math work, here's your, uh, your reading assignment, and here's your language arts assignment. Work on what's in your folder while I'm with these group, this group up here teaching them reading, okay? Right. Big big effect on that. It makes ADHD kids stay on task. They're more likely to be productive when they're doing that, and they're more likely to be accurate when they're doing it. However, if you look at year-on-year uh, -year academic achievement, medication has zero impact on that. So kids' annual achievement testing done at school, which is the gold standard of achievement right. in the field of psychology, does not improve with medication. So the big question is, why? That doesn't make sense. Why does why if you improve seat work in a child, improve his seat work productivity, that has no benefit in the long run on his academic functioning, on his probability of failing grades, his probability of having bad grades, his probability of dropping out of high school, his probability uh, okay. of Okay, so it's really short term. It's good for that hour in the classroom and that's it. Here's what you're saying, right? It's, it's, it's not for changing that behavior yes, over right. time. Yeah, and the reason for it is that we've looked for years also to try to say, is medication actually changing the learning process? And that it doesn't do. So it doesn't work in the parts of the brain that make you learn better. It just makes you perform better when you're doing your seat work. But performing in your seat work is apparently not related to long-term academic achievement. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's extremely helpful. So no need to despair, parents who are listening. If you started um, if you started medication first, there's still, it sounds really still plenty of opportunity to fully embrace parent training, social skills training, and um, daily report cards and, and make progress um, as, as um, you've been hearing. Um, yes. One thing, I would, one thing I would also add is that you just mentioned daily report card. For teachers... If a child's medicated for a teacher, that's great because then they don't have to worry about you know, working harder to get the child to behave better or to do more in academics. And uh, I, if I were a parent, one thing I'd really want to do is make sure that the dose of medication my child is taking at school is not sufficient to eliminate all of their problems. Because right. Because there's no incentive for the teacher to, to collaborate to set up a daily report card. So I right. would be very careful with that if I were a parent. Okay. Can you clarify the difference between behavior uh, modification therapy and cognitive behavior therapy? That's another uh, one that has people somewhat um, confused. Yes, I was just talking to a parent uh, in an intake the other day about that. Uh, CBT, or cognitive behavior therapy, is the most uh, common form of behavior therapy used with adolescents and adults. And basically, it's cognitively focused. So it's teaching people different ways of thinking about things 
and that different ways of thinking affects their behavior. So it's the most common intervention for adults who are depressed, for example. It is the best treatment for adults who are depressed. Uh, in kids, ADHD kids, trying to teach them how to think differently. Uh, there was a paper many years ago called Stop, Look, and Listen, where a person was developing an intervention where they just thought if they told ADHD kids to practice uh, stopping when they were starting to do something they shouldn't do, looking carefully when your teacher asked them to look and listening carefully, we thought them stop, look, and listen, that would improve their function. That's a form of cognitive behavior therapy. That turns out, turned out over studies over decades not to improve ADHD. What works for ADHD is uh, what's called operant behavior therapy, and that is using rewards and consequences to influence the child's behavior. So it's not encouraging the child to think differently, it's using rewards and consequences to reinforce the things you want the child to do more of and use consequences for the things that you don't want them to do more of. Okay. Two, two, very broad, two very broad approaches to behavior therapy. Most behavior therapists use both. With ADHD, they all use operant behavior therapy or behavior therapy and not cognitive. Got it. So rather than, than focusing on how your child's thinking about him or herself, you're focusing on, it sounds like the parent training part, the, the use of um, consequences and so forth to change behavior is the key element to what you're describing. Um, Absolutely. And the same for teachers. Same thing teachers do in the classroom, the same thing that we teach parents to do. Um, how about um, the question of how to find a good behavior therapy therapist or a good parent training program? Lots of people have posted that they really have had difficult um, a time with that. Um, well, one of the problems right now is that uh, <clears throat> with uh, the, all of the federal agencies that fund mental health centers, for example, have started to emphasize evidence-based practices. So they have told them all the mental health centers in the country that are funded in part by state or federal funds, you should be doing evidence-based practices, things that have a scientific evidence base. So unfortunately, a lot of therapists have learned that if somebody asks them what they do with ADHD kids, they have learned to say, oh, I do behavior therapy, because that's what uh, they're supposed to be doing. And if they don't do that, their, their mental health center is not going to get reimbursed for the services. So you have to, you have to look at what they're doing, actually. So uh, nobody who's, there's no intervention that a therapist can do one-on-one -on -one with an ADHD child in their office that will have any impact on the child's behavior. So one thing you want to avoid is somebody says, oh yeah, I'll see your child once a week and we'll work on social skills or we'll work on learning how to control himself better and so forth in my office. And the therapist and the child are doing something in their office. That's a useless treatment for kids with ADHD. You want to find somebody who says, I do behavioral parent training. And then you want to ask them the name of it the name of the behavioral parent training to do, you want to ask them to see the manual, and then you look in the web at whether that's listed in lists of evidence-based practices. It would be teaching parents how to use their attention and positive consequences to shape the child's behavior and how to use negative consequences, but not punishment, other negative consequences to shape the child's behavior. Okay. And learning how to do things like uh, Plan ahead. So plan ahead for what you're going to do if you are taking the child to the mall uh, and you anticipate problems. So it's logical ways of, of intervening with children's behavior and, and thinking about things as an adult that you can do uh, to help with them. And the same with teachers. Okay. Um, are there any books that, that are available that you recommend that parent, parents can buy or that, that thing people can read techniques for... Um, I mean, I understand that parent intensive parent training program is definitely probably the best, but is there anything that out there that would be helpful um, to for parents listening in to read more about parent training and using consequences and behavior modification? I think there are lots of them, and, and the key word is to look for behavior modification or behavior therapy in the titles of the parenting book. So okay. the, parenting book, the parenting book has chapters chapters that are entitled things like uh, um, praise, praise for good behavior uh -huh. and using time out for inappropriate behavior and setting up home routines. Uh -huh. Topics uh, like that, right. And look for topics like that. You don't look for topics like listening to your child and <laughs> right. being careful yeah. discussion with your child. So you can right. tell by looking 
go to Barnes and Nobles and go to the parenting section and you can leaf through the books and you can find one that, that has the term behavior modification all over the place. That's the book you want to buy. Okay. You want to buy one that talks about individual therapy for the child or dealing with the child's self-esteem. Uh, one of the most common ones that people buy is uh, Russ Barkley's books. Right. Uh, they're, they're great. Russ, yeah. Russ is a good friend. I, I, I don't like the fact that Russ recommends medication so much, but the parenting right. books are his parenting ADHD book is really terrific. Yeah, no question. Um, um, just ignore what he says about medication. Just focus on the other. Side. <laughs> okay. Um, Barkley is spelled B A R K E L E Y. Everyone, so I'm going to post that right now, um, and I will will post some names of his books, which are are really terrific. By the way, someone raised an interesting question here. She has she did parent training, and they said it had a great impact um, on their child. It was very successful. The one thing that it didn't seem to help with with social skills. And I can see that putting in place consequences and all wouldn't necessarily address social skills um, training, which we know is a huge issue for kids with ADHD. What are your thoughts specifically on social skills training? Yeah, so social skills training is what I was talking about when I talked about our summer treatment program. That is okay. entirely skills-based. Okay. So the social skills training is a, social, a therapist sitting in an office cannot do social skills training with an ADHD child sitting in the office. Right. What you have to teach, teach an ADHD child how to get along better with other kids is to teach him the skills that are important in doing that in childhood. That right. means for teaching him uh, having your child go to um, the soccer, enrolling him in a soccer league, and then going and watching what goes on and making sure that the coach is using good techniques Mm -hmm. to encourage the child to be a good team member and get along well. And then uh, I rate, watch my kids do soccer for their entire elementary and middle school years. And I chatted with the coaches and I came up with suggestions about things that they could do to help the kids with ADHD and, uh, and so forth. So our summer program is sports skills focused because that's a lot of how kids develop their peer relationships in childhood. Right. You can do you can do it through clubs. You can do it through rock climbing. There's a therapist in Miami who does rock, climb, rock wall climbing with ADHD kids. And again, it's teaching them uh, in the context of group sessions how they can be a member of a team and contribute as a team member. Mm -hmm. you, do, you can't do that sitting in a child, sitting with a child one on one with an adult and a child in the office. You have right. to have them practice and participate in the activity. So I'll just jump in here and say that um, there are a significant number of ADHD summer camps. Um, SOAR, the, the sponsor of this webinar, is one of them, but there are many others. You can find them in the Attitude Directory on our website. And we've written articles, and when we started writing articles about ADHD summer camps, I, I did some of the interviewing and the, the reporting myself because I didn't understand what they were. I thought, what is an ADHD summer camp, right? And what I discovered is that it is about social skills and some of the um, the practices that they describe are the ones that you're describing, which is intervening as the behavior, as the kid, children are interacting to help kids understand where, what they're, what they've done or not done that it isn't helpful to, for making friends. So it was an eye opener for me and I urge everyone on the, on the website to investigate, um, ADHD summer camps or programs, you know, not necessarily expensive ones either. There are many of them around the country and, and it sounds like, um, the, the programs that you're talking about are, are really terrific. Yeah. So, so on, on our web, on our website also, there's a, uh, there's a, a pamphlet on what parents need to know about psychosocial treatment for ADHD. Okay, great, great. That describes parent training and school-based interventions and social skills-based interventions. <clears throat> and they can also, parents can go straight to our um, to our website and download our summer treatment program manual. That's r really long, really long. Wow, that's fabulous, yes. But it's got the kind of stuff that they would want to look for in their the summer camp in their community. I mean, okay. if, you have a summer, if you have a summer camp for ADHD kids and is doing the kind of things that we've described in that, that uh, what parents and teachers know about, you know about ADHD on our website or in our treatment manual, then that's fine. You right. don't need to go to a, a, something called an STP. It's one of the ones that have adapted exactly what we do. You just need to have the same principles. 
That's all. So you find someone you could work with again who can use these materials to come up with a program, which, by the way, would benefit all children, I'm sure, not just those with ADHD. You know, oh, um, yeah. So. We did a study once where we had uh, kids with that ADHD in the summer program for a variety of reasons. And, <clears throat> and uh, many parents of those kids complained to us that we ruined their summer camp experience because they loved the STP summer camp experience. <laughs> That's we great. couldn't find another one that matched, that matched what we did as far as their kids were concerned. Um, questions from parents of older kids. They're feeling like their kids may be resistant at this point. Maybe it's too late. They're teens. Um, they're hostile to intervention. They don't want to go to, um, you know, they feel like maybe they've missed the window in terms of some of the parenting skills they might have put in place in elementary school. Any thoughts for parents of, of older teens? Um, teens? Um, They've got to keep working at it. For example, we have, and I think it's on our website, we have a, uh, a teen STP manual also. And for okay. 10 years, we ran a summer, we have run a summer treatment program for ADHD teenagers, and everything is just made for teenagers. So it's still a group context, still working in the summer, still attending a camp between 8 in the morning and 5 in the afternoon, but it's all teen based. So the activities they do are quite different from what the young kids do. Sure. They're half, half focused on academic functioning in the classroom and how to develop organizational skills and so forth, and then half on social relationships. So I would encourage parents like that to look around for activities like that that their kids uh, can get involved in, and then don't give up on the behavioral parent training part. But, right. but look in the chapters in Barclay's book about how parent training changes when you're working with a teenager. Okay. And a lot, of it, a lot of it means that the parents have to be engaged with the teen working with whoever the provider is. So okay. it's parent, it turns into things like parent-team negotiation instead right. of just parents learning something that they implement with their child. Yeah, the teen, the teen has to be engaged in the process, which I think is a challenge for many parents. The teen at that point may be checked out or... Um, or uh, another way, another way is non-compliant. Um, any thoughts on coexisting conditions? Some of the many, obviously, ADHD rarely exists in isolation. Many people have posted, you know, does behavior th therapy help with? And some people have asked about dyslexia, autism, um, various other coexisting conditions um, with ADHD. Yeah, SP sure. SPD, ODD, lots of other um other coexisting conditions? Well, behavior therapy is the uh, primary evidence-based intervention for all mental health problems, both in okay. childhood and in <clears throat> childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. So there are forms of behavior therapy. They look different. You're doing behavior therapy with a child who's anxious or depressed. It looks different from what I've just described. It also includes some cognitively-based interventions that you do with the children themselves, in mm -hmm. addition to the stuff I've been talking about. But behavior therapy is good for Everything. It's the leading evidence-based treatment for every form of child mental health disorder in one fashion or another. Okay. And there, there even is a really big uh, focus in uh, contemporary child among contemporary researchers in practices where you take the parts. If you have a child who has both ADHD and Asperger's, or both ADHD uh -huh. and anxiety, is you take the pieces out of each of the manuals for the different disorders that are relevant for that particular child and use just those pieces to try to get an efficient intervention. And that's done in lots of places now. Okay. Um, all right. So I just think that is, this has been incredible. This one person said, this is a complete eye opener. You have changed the whole way I think about my child. And so we thank you so much for all your work. I think it's really incredibly important. Can I and, say one last um, one? Yes, please. Look, everybody out there, look at the last uh, three slides in your slide set. One gives recommendations for treatment. One is a graphic depiction of the recommendation for treatment, the Buffalo treatment algorithm. And then the third is a list of things that are available on our various websites. And uh, one of them is effectivechildtherapy.fiu.edu or Effective Child Therapy Resource Library. Those are videos. And the videos of me giving talks of experts in almost every aspect of ADHD, oppositional disorder, anxiety, depression. They're really good talks and they're all free. S superb resources. This is just very generous to share this uh, this uh, work with everyone, and and people are very grateful. So thank you for uh, for to everybody who is listening in for spending an hour listening to this. Thank <laughs> you, Susan. 
Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.